Hi, everyone. Good evening, and thank you so much for joining the NATF online support group. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that all the participant lines are muted. So if you have any questions for Dr. Jenkins, please submit them using the chat function on your toolbar, and we will try to address as many as possible after his presentation. I'm now honored to introduce Dr. David Jenkins, who is a professor in the Department of Nutri Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto, and he's the Canada Research Chair in Nutrition and Metabolism. He is credited with developing the concept of the glycemic index, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard about today. It's, it's very popular um, as a way of explaining the way in which dietary carbohydrates impact blood, blood sugar. Um, today, his research is focused on the potential of diet to prevent and treat chronic diseases, primarily heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So I think his um, topic is really relevant to all of the patients and individuals that we have on the line today. I know I'm certainly interested to learn more about it. Um, so Dr. Jenkins, we're absolutely delighted to have you with us this evening. Thank you. And you can now go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you very much for your introduction. I think the presentation that I'm making right now is a little bit off the topic um, that I normally talk on, but nevertheless, it's an important one because I think many people and many of those in, in the audience and their, their, their patients um, are taking supplements. Uh, probably 30 to 40% of people in Western nations are either taking or have taken supplements. So they're, they're very, very commonly used and very important. And so I'd like to just talk about one aspect of them, um, and that is the, the importance of these supplements in terms of cardiovascular disease and overall length of lifespan or longevity. I have lots of conflicts of interest. If you notice any companies on the list that, um, or that aren't on the list rather, uh, please tell me later because I will contact them and ask them for funds for doing research uh, <laughs> because I think that's always very useful as we go forward. And statutory granting agencies are not that interested, to be honest, in, uh, in the sort of things that often affect ordinary people. Um, I've been a vegan for the last 10 years, uh, more than that, actually about 15 vegetarian since I was 12. So B12 deficiency and supplements are obviously very important to me. Um, so what we were asked to do, and it was, it was in fact the, the editor of uh, General American College of, of Cardiology, Dr. Valentin Fuston, um, who uh, suggested that one should look at vitamin and mineral supplements and CVD, cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality, and find out what there was of use um, out there in terms of supplements and should we be taking them. So we, we looked at almost uh, uh, 1,500 1, papers um, uh, from various databases, Cochrane, Medline, et cetera. <clears throat> and we, we finally landed up with 179 um, randomized control trials that we included in this particular analysis that I'm going to discuss with you. And the interest of it was really to see what sort of popular supplements people were taking and what they did. And I think probably uh, one of the, the common uh, themes that we used of vitamin and mineral supplements, uh, <clears throat> sort of the common ones that we're using, as you can see in, on the left, the, the multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, and, and vitamin C, those are the common things that people are taking most of. And as you can see, uh, looking at stroke, uh, total cardiovascular disease, mortality, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, and all-cause mortality, if you look at the diamonds and the confidence intervals, all the confidence intervals um, actually overlap the unity line. So uh, unfortunately, uh, that these are the, this is a cumulative meta-analysis. Um, what one can see is that there's no great advantage 
Uh, some may do a little bit more of some, some a little bit less than some, but the confidence intervals overlap uh, the, the, the unity line, meaning no big effect. So I have to disappoint people by saying the common things that we're eating probably do no harm, but don't do a great deal of good to the groups that we're feeding them. Uh, there may be people within a group who it does a little more harm to and a little more good for some, but the overall is no clear effect. If one looks though at some of the ones that one's taking perhaps a little bit less of, folic acid, B-complex, antioxidant mixtures, um, uh, B3, which some people will be taking, uh, niacin, nicotinic acid, there we have a somewhat different picture. These things do actually have effects. So folic acid, largely due to a large Chinese study, uh, you will see have an effect on total cardiovascular disease um, and another one on total um, uh, to, and stroke, stroke being the important one. Um, so I think that's those are important. So you're, you're, you can reduce stroke um, and reduce cardiovascular disease with folic acid. I want to put a caveat there. Um, China was the, was Chinese studies was was the one thing that swayed us in 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 this positive direction. And in China, there's no fortification. In uh, in North America, U.S., Canada, uh, there's fortification. In a lot of European countries, there's fortification. So we may not see the effects as clearly. But it is interesting that B complex, of which folate is a part, um, also showed positive effects um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of their effect on, on stroke. So I think that um, uh, there is some evidence that, that, that the Bs, uh, folic acid in particular, may be good uh, for, for stroke. As we move down the list to antioxidants, on the other hand, uh, one sees an all-cause mortality concern, as you can see, now to the right of the unity line, um, one can see uh, that all-cause mortality actually may be slightly increased with antioxidants, uh, very slightly, P less than, P equals 0.05, so just very slight. Uh, and another thing that interested us, if we move down to B3, which was the other significant thing, and we look at all-cause mortality, uh, actual niacin, although it may lower um, uh, blood cholesterol levels, if you take large amounts of it, um, it may actually increase all-cause mortality. It's not highly significant, but it's there. So I think one may, at P equals 0.05, one may have to be a little careful about that too. So those are the, those are the big ones that one's looking at. Um, folic acid, just a bit more detailed to show you that uh, the stroke risk here is shown uh, with the, with the red diamond to be on the left-hand side of the unity line. In other words, um, quite a, a significant effect, P equals 0.003. So there one does have an effect. Again, I want to put that caveat uh, that the highly influential Chinese folic acid supplementation study is the thing that uh, probably drove this in that direction. And CVD risk in general, again, folic acid showing uh, this good effect. If one looks at the B complex, um, uh, one can see that there's, if, if anything, there's a, a, a sort of, uh, uh, and also a reduction, a P equals 0.04, not as strong, but one does see a reduction here for stroke risk, which would go along perhaps with the, the fact that folic acid is included in the B complex. Uh, niacin, nicotinic acid, uh, which causes flushing, but also may reduce LDL cholesterol, um, had this uh, adverse signal. Uh, so we thought we should look at it more carefully. So we looked at it, those people who are taking statins to lower their serum cholesterol and those um, who were not taking statins. No statins first, and then background statin treatment. And as you can see, um, if you have no statins, um, there's a tendency for 
uh, niacin to do you good. But if you're taking statins, which lower cholesterol and therefore take away one of the good things, if you will, that uh, or cover off one of the good things that niacin may be doing. So you're just left with the, if you like, the non-cholesterol risk, you end up with an increased risk. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we have to be careful with 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 uh, with these 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 things when taken in pharmacologic doses. And I want to say that niacin was taken here in pharmacologic doses because it was used to lower cholesterol. So overall, no effect. But uh, if you break this down, uh, then you may get an effect, and it may not be a good one. Let's look then at the antioxidant um, story. The antioxidant story is an interesting one. Um, in general, uh, there was just a mild, as you can see, the red square, p equals 0.05, and you can see the red diamond uh, to the right side of the unity line, a small but significant increase in risk. So we wondered what the, the reason for this was. And so what we did is we removed sequentially um, different studies with different mixes um, from this particular analysis. So we could look at what happens if you looked at all the studies with vitamin C, uh, all the studies with, uh, with beta carotene and so on. So we removed each one sequentially. And what we came to was something very interesting. Um, when we removed all of them sequentially, we saw no effect unless we removed selenium. And that's why I, I, I mentioned selenium because it's not, a, it's not an antioxidant that you commonly think about, but it's important because it drives the endogenous, so-called endogenous system, the glutathione peroxidase and the superoxide dismutase. These are what your cells produce, uh, not the antioxidants you take in in the diet, but the ones you produce within your body. And they help to stimulate uh, the activity of these particular antioxidant enzymes. And if you remove selenium, then you see a risk with antioxidants, which is interesting. And we would suggest to you that that may be because uh, the antioxidants that you take in by your mouth suppress the endogenous system and leave you vulnerable then to oxidative stress, such as smoking or other uh, factors that may increase the oxidative stress within your body. Um, so, uh, that was interesting. So we, 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 would, we would draw your attention to selenium in mod, modest quantity as being useful if you're going to take antioxidants. And we say that because if you take selenium alone, it doesn't seem to have any great, great benefit. So it's in the context of taking antioxidants, it seems to be beneficial. So again, it shows the, the complexity of the sort of supplements that we use. So in summary, what do we have? Well, let's look at the multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, and C. And what we see is, as you can see, the p-values are non-significant for all of these. Some do a little bit more, some do a little bit less, but they're non-significant. Disappointing because calcium, vitamin D rather, is the, the sunshine vitamin. Everyone would like to see that doing more but at least it does no harm. So if you're taking it, it certainly seems to do no harm. And remember, we're only talking here about cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. We're not talking about whether your bones are better or we're not talking about whether you get less colds or less flu. We're talking about two specific entities, cardiovascular disease um, and uh, all-cause mortality. If one looks at the at those that we found some effects, you see the multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, um, all cause mortality. Again, um, some do a little bit more, some do a little bit less, but they're non significant. Um, a pity again for D because we'd hoped it might show something. If we then look at those, those, those uh, supplements that had had significant effects, um, Folic acid, again, for stroke, you can see very significant. Folic acid for cardiovascular disease, you can see significant. And the B complex, you can see for stroke. And that would be perhaps because of the 
the folic acid that it contains. And then if you look at uh, antioxidants and niacin, again, these are the these are the borderline uh, these are the borderline supplements, a borderline increase in all cause mortality uh, for both antioxidants and niacin. As, and as we commented to you, the antioxidants without um, without the selenium are the ones that uh, seem to be the ones that that cause the, the the issue. So if you're taking antioxidants, check that it's got selenium as part of the mix. And that I think is uh, is my quick appraisal of uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, and all cause mortality uh, for the vitamin and multivitamin and and, and multi uh, mineral uh, supplements that we use and the and those that are that are also just taken singly. Um, some people would say that we should be taking uh, a multivitamin multi mineral supplement because our diets are generally substandard. But again, uh, the data may be emerging, but at current, currently we don't have any strong evidence. Well, that's really interesting, Dr. Jenkins, and thank you so much for that informative presentation. It's you know, kind of disheartening in a sense to hear that these vitamins and, and supplements aren't as, you know, helpful as perhaps we had hoped that they were. So do you, are, are there any foods or is there a particular diet? A lot of the patients on this call um, have suffered a cardiovascular event or particularly um, a pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis. Is there any diet um, or any foods that you find particularly helpful in that group of patients or beneficial? Well, I think I think those who've got um, uh, disease of the of the coronary arteries, atheromatous disease, especially, or of the peripheral arteries, for that matter, people who've got claudication, uh, this sort of thing. Um, I think that the the evidence is very strong for plant-based diets, um, and these are very rich sources of all the things we're talking about, uh, but they tend to release them into the circulation differently. Supplements are good, but as you can imagine, when you take a supplement, you get a big surge, um, a, a high level, and then a tendency for the levels to fall off. When you're taking it in food, uh, you're taking it so that it's, if you like, slow release, and it will continue to release throughout the the, the period of digestion, which may be seven hours, by which time you've had another meal. So, you know, you get almost continuous cover at a reasonable level, not too high, uh, but certainly not too low. So mm. I would think that the plant-based diets in general are good. And of, of those, obviously, things like nuts and seeds uh, can lower blood lipid levels. They've got a good fatty acid profile. They're very useful. Uh, foods with with sticky fibers uh, take out bile acids and take out cholesterol too from the body if they've got plant sterols with them. Um, and these are found in green leafy vegetables. So green leafy vegetables and and uh, fibrous foods like oats and barley and uh, laxatives like psyllium even. Uh, these are all very useful in terms of lowering serum cholesterol. So I think that's that's good. And I think if you're taking uh, if you're taking reasonable amounts of these things, and if you're taking increased plant proteins in the form of legume proteins, beans, peas, lentils, soy protein, um, which people have shied away from, I think wrongly, um, in many ways. But I think these things have have what we call a 7s globulin fraction um, in their protein mix, and that tends to reduce um, apolipoprotein B synthesis by the liver. So I think that which which is the LDL the the, the the main particle of LDL cholesterol. So again, uh, for these sort of things, uh, folk who've got uh, uh, coronary heart disease, peripheral claudication, these sort of things, these plant-based diets are very helpful and have been shown to uh, in in very strict situations, along with exercise, obviously, as as, as part of the the, the the baseline of a healthy diet. A healthy lifestyle, 
I think these things have been shown to reverse cardiovascular disease, but taken in a very strict form, and certainly to slow it if you take it in uh, in the uh, in the regular way. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about you know a plant based diet, and you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that you've been vegetarian for most of your life, and you've been vegan, I believe, for about like the past ten or twelve years. I think you said. Yes. Um, do you have suggestions for people that are looking to perhaps move towards a vegan diet? Well, I think it's it's a very good point. I think one of the ways that you can be helped greatly is by um, buying a lot of the books that are out now uh, that one uh, that, that that deal with this. I mean, Dr. Neil Barnard has put out books um, in this area. I think he's done a great job. The physicians for responsible medicine have done a great job in this area. I think there are a lot of people who are putting out books now, uh, many of which I've I've written forewords to because they've been excellent books. Um, and I, so I think we've got a lot of good books that are out there. I would suggest though that uh, um, find yourself a a, a plant-based diet friendly dietitian because I think that's that that's someone you really ought to have a chat to, uh, perhaps a number of chats to. Um, I think that's very good. I think that also um, try some, there, there are a lot of good plant-based restaurants that are appearing all over the globe now. Um, in most of the big towns um, in, in, the, in Western countries, you can find plant-based uh, diet, uh, um, diets in, in very good restaurants. Uh, uh, my suggestion is look up Happy Cow um, uh, on on the web. Uh, Happy Cow will tell you in your particular area where there are good uh, plant-based restaurants and where there are health food stores where you can buy things. So I think this is a very good start. And then you'll find that you, you can find the same things in many supermarkets now. Things like soy milks and this sort of thing you find, tofu, these sort of things you find. You wouldn't have found them in days gone by but you do find them now. Um, and see how you like the foods that these restaurants produce, and then you'll get some ideas. You may look them up then and find out how they make these particular dishes. And I think that will, that will take a lot of the, uh, the sort of, uh, the, the apprehension, if you like, uh, of changing your diet, and give you lots of ideas of the sort of things you might enjoy. And I, because I think you have to, to, to an extent, enjoy what you're doing, otherwise you're not going to keep doing it. Absolutely. And you you mentioned, you know, people are have kind of shied away from soy recently, and I'm assuming that's because of the estrogen concerns there and increased risks of things such as breast cancer. Is that something people need to be concerned about and aware of, or is there new research showing that maybe not, you know, it's not as big a concern as people had previously thought? I think it's a real issue, and it's a very difficult issue to deal with. Um, it, it's an issue that I would say um, we've had now data that suggest very strongly that our original warning may not be quite correct for humans. It may be correct for um, nude athymic mice. These are mice that have no hair and they have no thymus. So they can take um, cells from human cancer cells, for example, can be injected under the skin and they can grow there. And if you feed them soy, they may grow a bit better. Um, and it may be due to the phytoestrogens. The, the problem is that, that the phytoestrogens do other things as well. Uh, they may actually stimulate the immune response. They may stimulate inflammation. Um, that that may be important when one's got abnormal cells. So uh, they may actually have a function also in keeping uh, cancer cells under control um, or not letting them grow. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you look at the athymic nude mouse, then that seems to be the model uh, that you'd go by. But if you look at the studies that have come out on humans, we see the reverse. Um, quite a long time ago in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, there was a meta-analysis showing that younger women who take soy have a significantly reduced incidence of breast cancer, and older women, postmenopausal, 
uh, tend to get some protection, although it wasn't statistically significant. So I think that was important. It came out quite early on um, and nobody listened to it. And then we've had studies that have been coming out, especially from the Shanghai Breast Cancer uh, Study um, cohort, uh, showing that the more soy you take, the less uh, breast cancer they had. So that was interesting. And then you had a study that was published in, uh, it wasn't, didn't get any, any publicity in the press, I have to say. Um, and then you had a study that came out in, uh, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal a few years ago, showing that women who were on adjuvant therapy, who actually had breast cancer and were now on tamoxifen, et cetera, uh, for their breast cancer, if they were soy eaters, uh, they had less, less obvious recurrence of the breast cancer and there was a reduction in mortality. So the data have gone in the other direction from the athymic nude mouse, um, which was, it is obviously a model that, that is used very frequently um, in, in cancer studies. It's a legitimate model, but it may not be appropriate for the soy story. The, the, the sad thing about it, to my mind, is that um, the press took up the athymic nude mouse story and everyone learned about it. I don't think anyone was, was left untouched by the effects of that story. Yeah. All these other stories have come out since and there's just been a sort of silence, almost a sort of yawning. Um, so people are flying or fleeing away from soy as quickly as they can because they remember the athymic nude mouse story. So I would say that soy still has a place in the diet. What about GMO soy and the non-GMO soy? Well, I think non-GMO for everything is a good idea because I think we probably shouldn't be having all the things that we put on our food and on our land uh, that are of a chemical nature uh, that, are, that are not perhaps uh, necessary. So I would I would try and take these away, and I would have I would have your organic food if you like, and your non-GMO. Um, I don't think the the GMO actually do any harm uh, to us personally, but I'm concerned that they may do harm to the environment because yeah. other species, uh, insects for example, which which eat these plants, may be actually insects that are a, a, a part of our our sort of general. Uh, well-being, uh, pollinators, etc. So I think one's got to be very careful um, how one deals with nature. But that's another story. Um, in terms of, of, of GMO and uh, its effect on, on us directly, we have no evidence of, of adverse events. We do have um, some evidence for organic, and organic does seem to be better in terms of uh, cancer incidence. Hmm. So it's, it's certainly a complicated issue, all of this, um, and kind of trying to muddle muddle through organic, non-organic, GMO, non-GMO, to eat soy, to not eat soy. You know, um, there's a lot well, of- I think, I think you're all right to eat soy, put it that way. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I had tofu on my salad for dinner, so that makes good, me happy. Good. <laughs> good. I hope you have some after we've spoken. Yes, <laughs> I will. Um, so a question a patient had is inflammation is all over the news these days is something that, you know, is really kind of a cause behind a lot of different diseases. Um, are there any vitamin supplements or foods that are particularly good at fighting inflammation or controlling it? Well, I think it's a, that's a very good, um, that's a very good question. And I think that the, the sorts of things we're talking about, the fruit and vegetables, um, the N3 fatty acids, perhaps to some extent, um, uh, that you find in, uh, in flax oils and uh, you find it in soy, uh, you find it in walnuts, etc. These sorts of things may have some anti-inflammatory properties. But one of the big ways that you can reduce inflammation is regular exercise. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong anti-inflammatory in many ways. Um, and so is weight reduction. If you reduce your body weight, if you're overweight, being overweight is in itself 
um, an inflammatory stimulus. So being lower, lower body weight is an anti-inflammatory stimulus. So if you like, if from the food point of view, just not eating too much, mm -hmm. that's a very good way of reducing inflammation. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the patients on the call tonight are, like I previously mentioned, have had a DVT or a PE or a stroke. Um, and so many of them are on warfarin. And there's been some new stuff in the media lately about how warfarin can impact bone density because the vitamin K loss. Um, so do you know anything about this? And if so, are there any supplements that patients can take to counteract this? Well, I think that warfarin is a is a good drug, and it's had its time honoured. But the so-called um, NOAX, the uh, things like apixaban, uh, which don't require the patient to have an INR uh, regularly, um, have been shown to be very effective um, for stroke prevention. And I would I would suggest that perhaps patients who want to take, for example, more green leafy vegetables. Uh, which may influence their INR, um, uh, and these sorts of things may may well want to have a chat with their physician and see whether uh, a change in medication uh, might be warranted. And I say might be warranted because they may have specific reasons why they would like to keep on warfarin. But as I say, um, apixaban um, and and uh, drugs of this of the knowing nature um, have proved useful in clinical trials head to head with warfarin. So um, I, I think that uh, this is something that people may want to think about. Yeah. With their physician, with their physician. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you talked about selenium and how to take, if you take it with antioxidants, it's um, effective in that context. Are there any supplements or vitamins that are more effective when taken together? Well, I, as I say, I think that um, possibly a little zinc um, along with it, because zinc goes along with the uh, with the selenium. Um, I think that these uh, together with the antioxidants, and and that that is a little bit of beta carotene, a little bit of vitamin uh, of of, of tocopherol, um, may be may be useful. I have to say, I have to say though. That there have have been warnings. There have been warnings against taking uh, beta carotene and the tocopherols, um, and so that the uh, um, the the interest in taking these particular vitamins is is waning. Can I put it that way? Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, uh, basically the enthusiasm is low and the necessity doesn't seem to be strong. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that I think that I would, I'm a little bit cautious about, about taking uh, large amounts of anything. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yep, understood. Okay. Um, so one of our, our attendees wants to know, what vitamins do you take every day? Well, I check my B12. Um, because a lot of a lot of vegan foods actually have got B12 added, so you don't often don't need. But I check my B12 um, usually about two or three times a year, and if I'm low, then I'll have a I'll have some uh, a, a course of B12 for a short while, and then uh, then usually I'm stocked up for the next few months. So um, that's about mine. I do, whenever I, I feel a cold coming on me, I take a lot of vitamin C, and I do believe that um, it helps me with a cold, perhaps helps me with the flu, I don't know, but certainly with a cold, uh, that I do take. Um, that's the one I take. A, a lot of people I know take, uh, take D because they think in the winter their levels are low, um, mm -hmm. and that's true. Uh, whether it does them a tremendous amount of good, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure whether people, whether a lot of the story comes, the D story comes from the people who have higher D levels in the serum or in the plasma, and they get the D by going and exercising out of doors in the sunshine, which is a very good way of getting sun. So maybe, maybe um, 
for those of us who live in in cooler parts of the world um, a good dose of florida um during <laughs> the middle of winter is not a bad idea do you know what i mean Can build <laughs> that sounds food. great <laughs> Absolutely. Certainly going to Florida seems better than taking a, a pill every day. That's for sure. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? I think you could enjoy it more. And if, necessary, if necessary, you could even go further afield. Uh, yeah. you go to Italy and then you could sip a glass of wine looking over the Mediterranean Sea. As the sun, <laughs> sun goes down. And maybe when are doctors be... going to start writing prescriptions for that? I think we've got to because I think there'd be much less stress. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there are so many diets out there today. Um, are there any that you really believe in and recommend? I know we talked about the vegan, but in terms of kind of diets that are out there right now, the keto diet, uh, Mediterranean diet, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they go on. They, um, and our dear, dear Dr. Atkins diet. Yeah. Um, the Ornish diet and uh, the Pritikin diet. The, we've got many, many diets, diets that have come and diets that have gone. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more plant-based ones are the ones that you should look for. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm interested in, in, the, in the paleo keto concept, but I would, I would, I would take it as a more plant-based rather than, uh, than their current state of, uh, very often heavy heavy meat uh, and uh, and egg based diets, which I think are probably uh, we can do without, even if not for our health, certainly for our environment. Mm -hmm. And you talk about you just mentioned eggs. So where is kind of the stance on eggs right now in terms of good for you, bad for you, okay in moderation? Well, I think that um, eggs are, um, have been part of the lacto-ovo-vegetarian diets. Mm -hmm. And people who have these diets, who, who don't have meat and have other animal products, uh, seem to do quite well. Mm -hmm. um, you've also got people who take um, burger with eggs over easy, and they don't <laughs> seem to do very well. <laughs> um so i think you've got to be very careful um what you're comparing it with and what the bedfellows are that the egg shares uh -huh. so and i think that's very true uh, the the bigger studies that are coming out now are still showing that eggs tend to raise cholesterol a little and they do tend to increase cardiovascular events mm -hmm. and i where does the where does the dose response line stop in other words is it half an egg a day one egg a day two three four five six seven eggs a day what is okay. it well i think part of it depends on your genetics and part of it depends on your risk and it seems that for diabetic patients um eggs are not a good thing so um i think one would say that since many of the of, of our folk with cardiovascular disease also have diabetes Mm -hmm. Be a bit careful there. Yeah. I think if you're saying is egg is is a is a boiled egg better than a beef steak? Yes, I'd say so. Uh, but do remember that it does pack a good a good amount of cholesterol. And yeah. although people are laughing at the fact that dietary cholesterol doesn't equal serum cholesterol, I would be very very careful about following that laughter mm. because. Two very famous nutritionists, um, Dr. Ansel Keys um, and Dr. Mark Hegstead of Harvard University, uh, both had equations, and in that equation, dietary cholesterol features in terms of raising serum cholesterol. So well, it may not be big, but there's going to be some. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm not sure that we want any more than we've got our bodies already producing. Because many of us in our bodies already produce too much cholesterol. You right. don't have any more in through the diet. Right. Interesting. Um, so we have one last question from 
um, the group. Do you know anything about the collagen trend and, and people adding collagen to everything and whether or not that's helpful at all? Well, collagen is a no, is a is a is a non-complete amino acid protein. Um, it is a sort of animal form of fiber, and some will say uh, that it does their their arthritis a great deal of good. Um, I'm not sure I've seen uh, the studies on this, so I wouldn't like to comment on it because I've not seen studies that have shown positive effects. Um, I, I think I, I worry about these things where people take something that's uh, specific out of the diet and just eat that or just say that that's going to be something that helps them. Yeah. My own view is that um, they should exercise well and wisely. Um, I think they should lose weight. Um, I think they should take their fruit and vegetables. I think they should take a lot of plant protein foods, which are useful. And I think they may find uh, that um, then the collagen was not necessary. Yeah. Interesting. So eat lots of fruits and vegetables and exercise. Absolutely. Don't smoke Don't and smoke. Um, keep all your risk factors under control, hopefully by diet and exercise. And if not, take medication specifically for those that are abnormal. And, you know, not smoking, where, what is your kind of philosophy or belief of behind, you know, there's a lot of people that say, oh, one glass of wine a day is good for you. Um, you know, alcoholic beverages, what should patients be well, aware of? True and people, have, people have promoted that. And I think it's true if you look at a, at a cohort study, epidemiological study, population-based study, and you look at people who, as I've just, as you've just been commenting, uh, mm -hmm. sit underneath an, an olive tree um, on the Mediterranean coast, uh, looking at the sunset and drinking a glass of red wine, is that going to kill them? No, <laughs> it's definitely not going to kill them, and they'll they'll probably be fine. Uh -huh. um, so I think that's that that is fine. Um, if you're taking people who um, lead stressful lives in New York, and they go home and they insist that they must have a glass of red wine for dinner every night because otherwise they'll die. I think that too is is a false hope. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think that it will necessarily do that good. I think what one has to remember is that it's true that alcohol, um, alcoholic beverages tend to reduce cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. That's true. And you can take a lot of it and it still does it. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to remember that you're not, although that may be many of your people uh, are, are interested in cardiovascular disease. They ought to be also interested in longevity, not yeah. just cardiovascular disease. Yeah. No. Dying um, late from a heart attack, but dying early from something else is not a good idea. And you have to remember that alcohol is, is, is related very closely to hypertension, and it's related <laughs> also to stroke. Mm -hmm. So alcohol may be related to stroke. Be careful of that. Be also careful that starting at zero alcohol, uh, there is a relationship to cancer. Mm -hmm. So again, you've got another major disease. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, you, you may be okay, okay to take one to two drinks a day for women or men, respectively, but. There's a difference between okay and being optimal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say that it's optimal. I'm going to say it's possibly okay. Mm -hmm. But I would be very careful generally. And I yeah. think it's more it's more the situation in which alcoholic beverages are are taken that perhaps is it should be looked at more carefully. If yeah. you're if you're okay. taking it as part of your relaxation, then that may be very different by taking it in a sort of medicinal way, or worse still, taking mm -hmm. it in an alcoholic way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I'd never thought of it in that context about the situation that you're you're 
drinking and not so much, you know. Well, people are actually stuff. saying that they're, they're, they're also concerned that we should be eating meals in a, in a more family oriented way. So it may be that there's a lot to be done with the nervous system um, as one's actually eating as well as the food that one eats. Yeah. Well, I think we should put together a study that sends us to Italy for a few months to sit on the Mediterranean and study these things. Don't worry, I shall do my best to, to, to be there with you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. It was such a treat speaking with you and you know, hearing all your knowledge and wisdom. It was really, really informative. Um, and I know that we all got a lot of that out of it. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. And I've got to thank Stephanie she here, who's been responsible for helping me put this together and get it to you. Wonderful. Well, yes, yeah, Stephanie was great to work with. Um, so thank you both so much. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. And good luck to you all. Healthy. Thank you. <laughs> good night. Good night.